Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to show a drama and sci-fi film called, Arrival. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Louise Banks gives birth to a daughter and watches her grow into a young woman, only to see her succumb to a rare and incurable disease. She is heartbroken and her life is changed forever. It starts on the day they arrived. Louise is a linguist professor at a local university. She's walking to her first class in the morning when she notices the ruckus around the television in the common areas. There's a strange hum in the air this morning but she ignores it. She greets her class but finds the students too distracted with their phones to pay attention. One student asks her to turn on the television. On the screen, breaking news is being broadcasted. An unidentified flying object has landed in Montana and eight more have landed in locations around the world. Just then, a university alarm rings and Louise dismisses her class. As she goes home, she finds the world changed and in turmoil. People are evacuating, jets flying overhead, and the military taking over. At home, Louise watches the news and learns that 12 of the unidentified objects have landed. Unsure of what to do, she goes to work the next day only to find classes indefinitely suspended. She stays in her office and tunes into live updates. Just then, two men visit her in her office. It's Colonel G.T. Weber from Army Intelligence. She remembers him from that time she helped in the translations with some insurgents. Weber tells her that she's the top choice for translations and that's why he's in her office and not at Berkeley's. He plays her a recording of a human speaking to an entity giving out low growls. Louise knows that it's an entity from the objects. She tells Weber that it's impossible to translate it unless she was in the same room with the speaker, observing because this is a language that doesn't exist on Earth. Weber takes this as a ploy for her to be part of the scene but he refuses. He doesn't want the research center to become a tourist site for anyone who has top security clearance. He tells Louise that if he leaves now, her chance is gone. He walks away but Louise calls out to him. She asks if they're going to ask Danvers next, another linguist, and tells him that before they commit to him, ask him the Sanskrit word for ward and its translation. Later that night, Louise falls asleep in front of the news when she wakes up to a helicopter landing in her backyard. Weber has returned and asks her for the meaning of Gavesti, the Sanskrit word for war, and Louise replies, a desire for more cows. Weber knows that Louise is more capable to take on the job and orders her to be ready in 10 minutes. Louise joins the team on the helicopter and meets Drive, Ian Donnelly, a theoretical physicist whom she will be closely working with. Weber tells her that the first priority is to know what they want and where they're from. They arrive at the Montana site and are briefed with the protocol and whisked away to Dr. Kettler who gives them some immunization shots. Louise arrives at the main control room and learns that the site is communicating with the other sites. She meets Agent Halpern from the CIA who tells her that they haven't gotten much information from the object since it landed. Louise and Ian are taken to another room where they're equipped with hazmat suits. They join a small team and make their way to the object, now known as the pod. Every 18 hours, a door opens up at the bottom of the pod and the team goes in via a platform. Louise watches in awe as they get inside the pod and feels the deep absurdity of the whole situation. Once the platform reaches its limits, the team jumps into the tunnel, floating their way to the rectangular light ahead of them. Louise hesitates, having second thoughts, but Weber grabs her and they make their way through the antechamber. They arrive at the main room and see a glass wall separating them from the entities inside. The team places a caged bird on the floor, indicating that while the bird is still alive, the oxygen levels in the room are safe. Soon enough, two giant cephalopod-like creatures appear behind the glass. They call the aliens heptopods, due to their seven limbs. The session is quickly over and they're brought to the disinfection room. Weber tells Louise and Ian that they have two hours to figure something out. They continue to listen to the news and watch as the world burns down in lockdown, riots, and cult rituals. Agent Halpern communicates with the other sites but they too are unsuccessful. The next day, they are set to enter the pod again when Louise has an idea. She brings a whiteboard and a pen, saying that they might be unable to understand their spoken language, but they might have a written basis of the language they're speaking. Inside the pod, Louise writes the word, human, and steps forward to show them. After a few seconds, one of the heptopods responds, drawing out its limb and creating a circular symbol with strokes. It continues giving out different circular symbols, giving the team its first breakthrough. Back at the site, Weber questions her if this is the right approach and how he would be able to explain it to the upper office. Louise defends her approach and says that if they don't teach the heptopods their own language, it would lead to a lot of miscommunication and things will take 10 times as long. Weber agrees for now but requires her to submit a list of words before the next session. Louise learns that not all countries are open to this friendly approach. 
The government is afraid that the other countries would follow General Shang and China's decision for a hostile move. Meanwhile, Louise explains to Weber that in order to communicate with the heptapods, they first have to teach them the basics of the English language before they can move on to the big question, which is the purpose of their arrival. They go back into the pod and Louise introduces herself. Sensing the heptapods' confusion, Louise walks forward and takes off her hazmat suit. The team panics but she reassures them it's fine and continues with the operation. She walks to the screen and puts her palm on the glass. One of the heptapods follows her action and they properly introduce themselves again. Ian unzips his hazmat suit and introduces himself as well. She asks them who they are and each of the heptapods writes their names on the glass. Ian decides to nickname them Abbott and Costello. As they get back from the camp, Louise dreams about her daughter for the first time. Due to the session's success, Weber allows the operation to continue despite the contamination risks. Meanwhile, tensions from the soldiers arise from the camp, not knowing what kind of threat they're up against. Later that night, Louise dreams of her daughter again. They are in a field, exploring the flowers and picking rocks at a nearby creek. Over the next several weeks, Louise and Ian continue their research. Aside from seeing and hearing them, the heptapods leave no other footprint. The chemical composition of their spaceship is unknown. Assuming that the pods communicate with each other, they do so without detection. They also still have no idea why the pods chose to land on these specific locations. One of Louise's first breakthroughs is learning that there is no correlation between what a heptapod says and what a heptapod writes. She also learns that the heptapod's writing is semiseographic, which means that it represents meaning and doesn't convey sound. Through the Pakistan site, they learn that a heptapod's logogram is free of time. Their writing has no forward or backward direction. Linguists like Louise call this nonlinear orthography, which makes them think if this is also how they process ideas. Louise and Ian study their language enough to create their first reply. Now, they're working on expanding their vocabulary which would take another month. One night after a session, Louise and Ian hang out at the back of a pickup truck overlooking the pod. Ian expresses his admiration for her intelligence and willingness to keep going and they talk a little bit about their personal lives. Louise thinks it's all up to them now and Ian is glad that it's become that way. Outside the site, the world hasn't coped well with the presence of the pods. The looting and riots continue especially after a leaked photograph of the aliens goes viral. The tensions around the site grew worse as well, with some soldiers thinking it's better off to draw the first fire before the aliens attack. On another night of working, Louise dreams of her daughter again. She's showing her a book about planets and her daughter shows her a picture she drew for her project in class. She begins explaining to her why she and her father aren't together anymore, but her daughter says it's fine. She's cut from her daydream by Ian and goes out to get some air. She thinks of her again. This time she sees her as a child and then later on as a teenager, lying sickly on a hospital bed. Later on, Louise finds herself in her room with Ian who's discussing with her the sapir wharf hypothesis, wherein if you immerse yourself in another language, you can actually rewire your brain. He asks if she's dreaming in her language and when she looks up, a heptapod is in her room. Louise wakes up in her bed, feeling relieved that it was all a dream. She meets up with Weber who leads her to the control room to do a Mandarin translation. It turns out that their satellite picked up on a phone conversation with the Chinese military chief, General Shang. Louise translates the first sentence, saying that each of the 12 is offering advanced technology and that their science team is attempting to decode the sets. She tells Weber that she doesn't understand the following phrases, suits, honor, and flowers. He tells her that an hour ago, China mobilized forces and now Russia is following their lead. Louise realizes that the phrases belong to sets in Mahjong tiles and learns that they're using a game to converse with their heptapods. She raises her concerns about how problematic this is, with every conversation becoming like a game and every idea expressed through opposition, victory, and defeat. Weber then gives her the ultimatum and orders her to ask the big question, whether they're ready or not. Louise, Ian, and the team enter the pod again. Louise begins to form her logograms, asking the heptapods their purpose. Costello responds with a message saying, offer weapon. Back at the site, an argument ensues between Louise, Weber, and Agent Halpern. Louise insists that the heptapods may not know the difference between a weapon and a tool, and with a complex human language, sometimes one can be both. Ian adds that they don't know if the heptapods are offering a weapon or asking them to offer one, as the beginning of a trade. The only way to know the difference between the two is to go back in. A call interrupts their meeting and Agent Halpern offers his theory that this is the way for the aliens to divide them and make them fight amongst each other. The council disbands and Louise and Ian feel defeated. Back at the control room, Chaos is unraveling. 
China and Russia have received the same message, misinterpreting it as a threat, and have cut their communication with the other pod sites, going off the grid and offline. Louise insists that this will only worsen the situation and they need to communicate with each other. She runs off with Ian to re-enter the pod. Afraid of the impending threat, several soldiers at the pod have formed a mutiny, carrying several boxes of explosives and placing them in the room, set to detonate in 10 minutes. Louise and Ian arrive and one of the soldiers tries to stop them, but they eventually let them go, despite knowing that the bomb will kill them. Louise and Ian enter the room to talk to Abbott and Costello, completely unaware of the bomb sitting several feet away from them. Louise asks them if they are offering the human something. The heptapods reply with words like technology, visitors, and friends. She then asks them to give the technology now. Suddenly, Abbott starts tapping on the glass. Unbeknownst to them, Weber has sent security to arrest the rogue soldiers. Back in the room, Abbott keeps tapping on the glass. Louise walks forward and thinks Abbott wants her to write on the screen. She places both palms on the glass and begins writing together with Abbott. While in the middle of it, she dreams of her daughter again, setting her off to sleep and holding her hand. After they finish writing, Costello jets off, leaving hundreds of symbols on the screen all at once. They look back outside, hearing gunshots. As the time ticks down to zero, Abbott forces them outside of the room just as the bombs explode and the room closes. Louise and Ian are thrown into the antechamber, unconscious but alive. Louise wakes up and finds herself in Dr. Kettler's office with a concussion. They have survived the blast and Kettler informs them of the rogue soldiers. She looks for Ian and finds him in the main room with Weber and the rest of the team. She tells them that they have to go back and explain to the heptopods what happened. He says that it's impossible because his orders have now changed. They need to evacuate and prepare for retaliation. Just then, a rumbling interrupts their conversation. The team runs outside and sees the pod lifting itself several miles higher from the ground. Later that night, China officially declares war against the aliens, urging several other countries to do the same. Louise and Ian continue to decode the heptopod's last message. As they discuss, Louise's daughter enters her mind again. She's a young teenager now and she's asking Louise about a certain term that means two parties make a deal and both get something out of it. Back at the site, Louise wakes up from her dream and learns that Ian has made a breakthrough. He says that the symbol for time is everywhere. He then calculates the amount of negative space in the message and concludes that it means one of 12. Louise presents this discovery to the council, saying that the message that the heptopods gave them is one of 12 and that they need to communicate with the other sites to piece the 12 messages together. Agent Halpern interrupts her and tells her that it's no use because they're blacked out and everyone is preparing for conflict. He then plays a recording taken from Russia. The aliens gave their final message, there is no time. Many become one. The recording is then cut off by gunshots. Louise insists on her theory but Halpern remains hostile, asking how they are going to convince the other sites to share their data. Ian pipes in, saying they offer their data in return, making it a non-zero-sum game. Louise picks this up and remembers this from the conversation with her daughter. As Louise listens to the men argue in the room, she zones out and leaves. There's not enough time anymore and she must take the matters into her own hands. She walks to the pod and surprisingly, the pod sends a vessel down. She enters the vessel and is engulfed in a fog-like state. She struggles for a minute to breathe before her lungs stabilize. As the vessel opens, she finds herself in the room behind the glass wall filled with a similar fog. Costello approaches her and Louise learns that Abbott has died from the explosion. She breaks down and apologizes on behalf of humanity. She then asks the heptopod to send a message to the other sites. Costello says that Louise already has the weapon and that she should use it. She doesn't understand and asks their purpose. Costello says their purpose is to help humanity because, in 3000 years, they will need humanity's help. She asks them how they can know the future. Just then, her daughter enters her mind again. They're at the same field, playing at the same creek. Louise looks confused and finally asks Costello who the child is. It turns out that Louise's dreams of her daughter weren't dreams, but premonitions of the future. With that last message, Costello disappears into the fog. Louise is ejected as the pod turns sideways. A convoy approaches her and Ian wraps a blanket around her. Just as she's being put in the car, she has another premonition. She's standing at the lake with her daughter. She asks Louise why her father doesn't look at her the same way anymore. Louise feels conflicted but tells her it's because she told her father something that he wasn't prepared for, something about a rare and incurable disease. In the present, Louise just realizes why her future husband left her. Meanwhile, all the pods around the world have also turned sideways and the entire planet is preparing for global war.
As Louise wanders through the site, she has another premonition. Her future daughter asks her why her name is Hannah. Louise tells her that her name is special because it's a palindrome, which means if it's spelled backward, it will still say Hannah. In her vision, she also sees herself publishing a book about the heptapods universal language and teaching the language to other humans. She finally realizes the heptapods true purpose. Their weapon is their language and they shared all of their language with humanity. Their language opens up time and once you learn it, you begin to perceive time the way they do, in a non-linear state, so that you can see what's to come. She shares her discovery with Ian and Weber, but Weber tells her that the mission's over. Outside, Louise has another premonition. This time she's attending a gala at the United Nations. General Shang approaches her and says that he only attended because he wanted to meet her. He tells her that 18 months ago, she did something even his superiors were unable to do and changed his mind. He continues to say that she called him on his private number. Louise is confused and says that she doesn't know his private number, but the general whips out his phone and shows the number to her. General Shang tells her that now she knows. He feels that it was important that he shows her that number despite not knowing the reason why. He then tells her that she told him something that he will never forget. She told the general his wife's dying words. At the present time, it dawns on Louise the thing that she has to do to stop this global war. She ventures back to the site and gets a hold of Agent Halpern's satellite phone. She calls General Shang's private number. This alerts security and they send several soldiers to confront her. Louise evades capture and hides in the disinfection room. General Shang answers the call and she tells him her purpose. Ian joins her in the room and shields her from the soldiers. She finally tells General Shang her message and he receives it. The call is a success and she puts her hands up in the air, surrendering to security. Suddenly, China pulls out from the attack and the other countries follow. The 12 sites then agree to share their data and complete the pieces of the puzzles together. With humanity working as one, the pods begin to elevate and disappear into outer space, just as quickly as they have arrived. Louise and Ian stand outside as they watch the site evacuate. She asks him if he would change things if he could see his whole life from start to finish. He tells her that the most surprising thing that has ever happened in his life was not meeting the heptopods, but rather, it was meeting her. He then declares his love for her. Louise looks at him, knowing that this is the face of her future husband, and reciprocates his love with an embrace. Even though Louise knows what's going to happen in the future, them getting married, giving birth to Hannah, and Hannah passing away, she embraces it fully and wholeheartedly, despite knowing that Ian will eventually leave them. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.